Hello and welcome to the Impact Aid 101 webinar. So excited to see so many people join already. Happy Tuesday. It's already mid August. Um, I am Nicole Russell. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Federally Impacted Schools. And I'm joined today by our NAFA staff, Jason Scamenti, our policy and advocacy director, and Anne O'Brien, our communications director. Just introduce yourself in the chat. We want to know who you are, where you're joining from, and what type of impaction your school district has, whether it's um, military impacted, national Indian, you know, Indian lands impacted, or you receive a federal property, Section 7002. And it's always nice to know how many years you've been involved with impact dates. So please tell us that as well while we wait for a few more folks to join us. It's great to see some school liaisons on the webinar. Hi, Robert, Andrea, Melissa, Darcy. It's so great to see so many people joining us from all over the country because Impact Aid impacts 48 states nationwide. All right. Hi, Brian, Chantrell, Shannon, Tina. Wonderful. All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and get started. So, as you continue to introduce yourself in the chat, I'm going to just let you know what to expect on today's webinar. We are going to give you an overview of Impact 8. So what it is, why it exists, eligibility, how it all works. And then we're gonna end with some of our advocacy successes. So the National Association of Federally Impacted Schools, or NAFIS, has been around for over 50 years. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership association representing impact aid recipients nationwide. Our mission is fourfold. We educate Congress and the administration on impact aid. We provide technical assistance to you, school districts, and Congress as well. We coordinate with the House and the Senate Impact Aid Coalitions, and we serve as an umbrella to four subgroups that we serve. So we are your voice on Capitol Hill. We are headquartered just steps from the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. We are your experts on all things Impact Aid information and technical assistance. Uh, we also work incredibly closely with the U.S. Department of Education Impact Aid Program Office in Washington as well. We are your professional network. We don't only hold one, but two annual conferences in Washington, D.C. We have one coming up, so please check out our website for registration information there. We provide newsletters weekly, as well as action, information alerts, and a quarterly news publication as well. And please be sure to follow us on social media. We are active on X or Twitter and Facebook specifically. So the NAFIS family is made up of four different subgroups that we serve. There are the federal lands impacted schools. Those are school districts that receive Section 7002 federal property funds, which you'll hear more about later. The Learning Opportunity Impacted Schools Association, those are school districts that receive 50% or below a lot. And again, you'll learn more about that. Military Impacted Schools Association and the National Indian Impacted Schools Association. 
So what is Impact Aid? That's why you're all here today. It is a federal program designed to reimburse school districts for lost property tax revenue due to the presence of non-taxable federal property. So Section 7002 is tied to the federal land. Section 7003 is designed to compensate school districts for those additional costs like educating military connected and Indian lands connected students um, due to the presence of that federal property. So I'm sure many of your school district revenue breakdowns look a little different than this, uh, but this is what your typical public school district revenue breakdown might look like. About 50% from comes from the state and the other 50% is gonna be coming from those local residential and commercial property taxes. Now, of course, impact aid recipient school districts look a little different because when the federal government owns a, a substantial piece of the land inside the school district bounds, uh, it will impact the school district revenue significantly. So what is federal impaction? What does that mean? Well, that could be a military installation, an Indian trust or treaty land, or Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act land, federal low rent housing. Um, however, that does not include Section 8, um, as well as VA hospitals, national laboratories, uh, national reservoirs, you name it. Impact Aid is the oldest elementary secondary education funding program. It precedes the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it was signed into law in 1950. So it, is, it was designed to assist LEAs with the cost of construction of school facilities way back when. So as you can see, it's grown um, to what it is today to address the needs or um, and then we address the underfunding um, of the program uh, since its founding. So Impact Aid assists LEAs with the cost of education um, associated with federal defense activities that brought additional students to that LEA. Um, really, the law began because Congress realized um, it has a role to play in the revenue of local public school districts due to the presence of federal property. Um, now, those additional categories of students were added to the law later on, like the military on and off base, um, Indian lands students, and low rent housing connected students, all of which have different weights associated with them. So Impact Aid falls under Title VII of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, it was last reauthorized in 2015. And importantly, Impact Aid is efficient and flexible. The funds go directly to the local public school district, not through the state as many other federal programs do. And the funds are flexible. The school district, um, they, it's up to them to decide how those funds are used because we know um, that those decisions should be made at the local level because all of your school districts have very unique needs and circumstances. And those funds can be used for anything from materials to school buses to paraprofessionals. Now, Impact Aid supplants, it does not supplement funding. So that is a key difference um, to other federal dollars like Title I, IDEA, et cetera. Now, states cannot consider Impact Aid as state aid. The only exception being the state of Alaska, which is the only state that is uh, equalized, um, and that is its own uh, beast of an animal. So Impact Aid has 13 sections to the law, uh, four of which um, we will concentrate on today, and those four all have dollars associated with them. So we're going to first start off with Section 7002. Those are payments relating to federal ownership of property. Then we'll go on to Section 7003, basic support, and those payments are for 
eligible federally connected children. That also includes um, a special line item for section 7003D, and those are specifically uh, geared towards payments for children with disabilities. Then we'll touch on section 7007 construction. And lastly, there is a section 7008 facilities. I just wanna point out that this facilities section is for the US Department of Education owned facilities. I think there's roughly four of them left remaining. The US Department of Education is in the process of transferring ownership over to the local LEAs for those remaining facilities. All right, so I am going to now turn it over to my colleague, Jason Scamenti, our Director of Policy and Advocacy, to give you a deeper dive into Section 7002. Jason, take it away. Thanks, Nicole, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as Nicole mentioned, in these next few slides, we'll discuss uh, Section 702 Federal Property Program. <clears throat> uh, when the federal government takes over ownership of land, the property comes off the tax rolls. However, school districts must continue to educate students in their district with less tax revenue. This program is designed specifically to, specifically to help ease that burden. However, Section 7002 is uh, funded significantly less than the identified need. In fiscal year 2024, Congress appropriated uh, $79 million for this section of impact aid. Uh, to fully fund that program, Congress would need to appropriate a total of $1.12 billion. Uh, to be eligible for 7002 payments, property must be, have been acquired by the federal government after 1938. Uh, when acquired, the property is 10% or more of the assessed value of taxable property in the district, and the property cannot have been acquired in exchange for other federal property. And finally, the school district must not be substantially compensated by increases in revenues from federal activities from the property. In fiscal year 2024, 200 school districts were eligible for 702 payments. Eligible lands include, uh, as Nicole mentioned earlier, Army Corps of Engineers projects, national forests and grasslands and laboratories, uh, and federally owned dams and reservoirs, and a few more other uh, sections. Uh, eligible districts are paid either as a foundation payment, which equals 90% of the payment received in fiscal year 2009, or an average payment for fiscal years uh, 2006 to fiscal year 2009 combined. Uh, after foundation payments are made, newly identified eligible districts are paid on a prorated basis with the remaining Section 702 funds. Here you can see an, expert, uh, an excerpt from our annual uh, impact aid payments overview, which provides a snapshot of how impact aid payments are distributed in each state and district. Uh, here we see the 702 payments for Missouri for fiscal year 2024. This is actually a bit of a sneak preview. We'll be uh, hopefully in, uh, releasing our FY24 impact aid payments overview next week, so you can keep a lookout for that from us. Uh, as you can see here, they are broken down by school district, congressional district, or districts for districts that are uh, that their boundaries are located within more than one congressional district, uh, as well as uh, federal acreage, total acreage, uh, percentage of federal acres, and uh, FY 24 actual payment, and finally, what the full payment would have been if the 702 program had been fully funded. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of districts there with a dash. Uh, a dash in the full funding payment column denotes a school district that has selected the opt-out option on their Section 702 impact date application and chose to only receive their foundation payment, foregoing their final payment. In, in summary, these school districts have a tax revenue substantially have their I'm sorry have their tax revenue substantially reduced because the federal government took ownership of the land. Federal government doesn't pay taxes. Impact date attempts to make up for this loss, but does so at a rate of only seven cents on the dollar as of uh, fiscal year 24. Uh, now I'll turn it over to my colleague Anne, who's going to discuss the Section 7003 Basic Support Program. Right. Thank you, Jason. And yes, so I'm going to uh, talk us through the Section 7003 Basic Support Program. It is the largest program um, 
in the impact aid department, both in terms of its funding, uh, which in FY24 was $1.474 billion, um, as well as in terms of the number of school districts it serves, which is 943 in FY2024. Um, I'll also talk briefly about the um, 7003D, the Payment for Children with Disabilities, which was funded in FY24 at about $48 million, as it had been for several years past. Um, so as we look at the basic support program, um, to be eligible for it, a school district must have 400 federally connected students and average daily attendance, or 3% of students in average daily attendance must be federally connected. Who are federally connected students? Federally connected students either reside on federal property with a parent employed on federal property. We call these our civilian live on work ons. And this might be someone like a national park ranger who's living on the park and working on the park um, and their children go to your school district. Um, we have those who reside on federal property with a parent on active duty in the uniformed services. We call those our military on base kids. Um, they may reside on Indian lands. We call those our Indian lands kids. May have a parent on active duty in the uniformed services, but do not live on federal property. We shorthand call them our military off base kids. Um, they may reside in federal low rent housing projects. Uh, these are only federal projects. They do not include Section 7. Uh, Section 8 housing. Um, it's really only those projects that are owned by the federal government. Um, and then there's a have a parent who either resides on federal property or works on federal property. Uh, we call those our civilian live on or work on kids. Um, and these students have a little bit of a higher threshold in order to count for impact aid. So for all of the other types of students, um, the total of those types of federally connected students must be 400 or 3% of your student population in average daily attendance. To count the civilian live on or work ons, you have to have either 1,000 of those students in your average daily attendance or they need to make up 10% of your average daily attendance. Um, because the payments, um, I apologize, I'm having some technical difficulties moving the slides. Um, so 7003 payments are based on several factors, one of which is the number and type of those federally connected students in your average daily attendance. Um, another of which is the actual cost of education, which is indicated by something we call the local contribution rate or LCR. There is a measure of school district need included in the payment calculation. That's measured by what we call the learning opportunity threshold or lot percentage. And then it also is based on congressional appropriations. So how much uh, money Congress gives the impact aid program every year, and that'll determine what's known as the lot percentage payout. So because the section 703 payment formula incorporates the number of federally connected students, you have to count your federally connected students in your school district, and you have to do it every year. Um, now, due to COVID-19, for FY22 and FY23, school districts were able to use previous student counts, so from pre-COVID times. FY24 was the first time that um, actual post-COVID enrollment numbers were used in calculating impact aid payments. Um, and that's important to, to remember for later. But uh, in the meantime, just keep in mind, you have to count your students every year for impact aid. And the count date must be at least three days after school starts. So that means like, for example, if kids are coming in over the summer and you're registering for your district, you can't, you can't count them based on that information. They are forms that need to go home at least three days after the school year starts. And they also have to be done before January 31st. Um, we recommend they were done well before January 31st because January 31st is the day that the impact date application is due. Um, so you definitely want to, to have your count done and all of your um, forms checked, you know, in time to enter the data on the application by January 31st and submit that application before January 31st. You are allowed to amend your application until June 30th, however. 
So in counting your students, um, there's a couple different options. One is called a parent pupil survey form. That is a piece of paper often, although you can also do it electronically in some circumstances uh, that is signed by the parent or guardian. Um, you may require additional certification on that form to confirm that the land is federally owned. There's also something called a source check, uh, which is a collaboration between the school district and the federal property um, where the school district certifies certain information um, about the students. So their name, um, their IEP status, uh, the fact that they're enrolled in the school district, and then someone on the federal property would certify their connection to the federal land. Uh, the connection to the federal land is the critical piece in counting the students. Uh, yeah, you know, there's no other factor that that matters in determining if the students federally connected. Um, you know, if I were residing on Indian lands, my kids would count for impact aid, even though I'm not Native American. Um, it's because of the land that kids count. Uh, likewise, if I, you know, worked for the federal government. Um, in Virginia, because that's where I live, it has to be in the same state. Um, my kids would count because of my connection to that federal property. Uh, this is an example of a sample parent pupil survey form. Um, I believe there's a question on this in the chat earlier, but this comes from the US Department of Education uh, website, the impactaid.ed.gov. They have a bunch of sample materials. If you're looking to make sure your forms are uh, collecting the correct information, this is an excellent resource. This is a sample source check form. And again, this would be something that the school district would fill out and provide to some certifiers. Um, this one happens to be for category C children who are Indian lands children, but they have them for every category of federally connected children. And then there are also, um, this is their signature block for these source checks. So you will see for this particular category of student, you would need to get the LEA to certify that those students were enrolled. The special education uh, coordinator would certify those students who had an IEP, you know, actually did so as of the, the survey date. Um, you would have a tribal official certify the parents, the students resided on trust or restricted parcels, and you would have BIA or tribal realty certify that the properties themselves actually are tax exempt. Um, so there's several checks to make sure that we get an accurate count of students. Um, some things to keep in mind as you're, you're prepping for this upcoming application cycle. Many school districts have lost eligibility because their forms did not collect the appropriate data. You know, for example, if you're sending out a parent pupil survey form and it doesn't have students birth dates on it, none of those students are going to be able to count. So you need to make sure that your forms have all of the data that you're required to have to get your students to count. Um, we highly recommend that school districts submit those forms to their impact aid state analyst in advance of sending them home uh, for approval. You know, otherwise you, you can lose funds for, for incomplete data. It's also worth noting that you need to keep records. That means every parent pupil survey form, every source check um, for three years after the final payment was issued. So that's going to be about five years in total. So when we're talking about federal, federally connected students and, and the count, you know, curious, how many federally connected students are there right now? Um, that that trend has has it's changed a lot over time. So way back in the 1950s, when Impact Aid was first signed, there were 442,000 students. They were all civilians because remember, originally only civilian students counted. Over the years, as Indian lands, military, and other types of students have been added, you know the numbers have grown. Um, by '94, there were over 1.7 million. By two, 2015, you were at about 884,000. Um, you know, numbers have been dropping uh, kind of just as a general trend over the past decade. But if you look from 2023 to 2024, there was a very dramatic drop in the number of students that were considered federally connected, right? You're going from 817,926 in 23 to 677,755 in FY24. Why was there this drop? goes back to that, that student count every year. So when we were talking about that, if you remember, I mentioned there were a couple years 
school districts didn't have to do it. There was COVID relief legislation, the Impact Aid Coronavirus Relief Act and the Supplemental Impact Aid Flexibility Act that allowed school districts to use pre-COVID numbers um, for their student counts. FY24 was the first year those post-COVID enrollment numbers have accurately been counted for impact aid. And I mean, following national trends on public school enrollment, they're way down. Um, we don't anticipate a similar drop for FY25 uh, because, because that drop has been accounted for already. But um, this is something to note as you're thinking about your student count. Um, typically, the more students, you know, the higher your payment is going to be. Um, and you do want to maximize your student count to make sure that you get as many students who are eligible to, to turn in their forms as possible. Um, you know, nationally, because remember, impact aid isn't only used for the federally connected students. It can be used for any any um, purpose the local school district deems it's necessary for. Um, there's about 8 million students attending schools that receive either 7002 or 7003 funds. So the payment formula is a bit more complicated than just how many federally connected students do you have. Um, because different types of students have different financial impacts on a school district, there are several different weights that are assigned to the different types of federally connected students. And you get paid on those weighted units, not directly on the number of kids. So if you look at your different types of federally connected kids, your Indian land kids are weighted at a 1.25. Your military on base and your civilian live on work on are at a 1.0. Your military dependent off base uh, is a 0.2, your low rent housing is a 0.1, and your civilian live on or work on is a 0.05. So why again are these different weights? Well, if you think about like a military on base student, their parent is working for the military, which is you know located on land that is not paying property taxes. Um, there might be stores uh, located on that installation that they're shopping at that don't pay sales taxes. Uh, and then they're living in property that also does not generate tax revenue through the local district. Whereas a military off base student, their parent might be working on the installation or is working on the installation, but they might be living or they probably are living in housing that is generating tax revenue for the local district. They're maybe shopping at stores that are generating that sales tax revenue. So the weights are an attempt to um, kind of accurately measure the or accurately account for the um, differing financial impacts that each type of federally connected student has on its school district. And this is an example of how that might play out. So say you have a school district, it has Indian lands, military on, military off, and low rent housing and civilian, civilian live on or work on students. To figure out your number of student weights, you're gonna multiply the total number of students by the ADA ratio. Because it's not how many kids are enrolled in your school district, it's how many kids are attending school every day. So we apply an ADA ratio uh, before or as part of the payment calculation. And then you're going to apply your student weights. So if you're looking at your 100 Indian land students, ultimately that's gonna give you a weighted student unit of 117.13. Whereas if you're looking at your low rent housing students, that same 100 students would give you a weighted unit of 9.37. So I'm experiencing those technical difficulties again in advancing the slides. Ah, there you go. Um, the next factor in the impact aid payment uh, calculation is the local contribution rate. So unlike most federal education programs, the impact aid basic support formula does consider the actual cost of education, again, known as the LCR, the local contribution rate. Um, this is determined by the Center for National Education Statistics or the National Center for Education Statistics, NCES, in most cases. Uh, and there's a number of different ways this can be calculated. Um, most school districts either use one half the national per pupil expenditure from three years prior, because that's how long it takes data to be finalized, or one half the state average per pupil expenditure, again, from three years prior. Um, so NCES will calculate those LCRs uh, 
for the Department of Education um, for their use, and they will publicize those. We'll typically get those in September. Um, and again, this takes into account the actual cost of education. So, for example, inflation is reflected in the LCR. Um, you know, at this particular point in time, COVID relief funds are going to be reflected in the LCR. So we're anticipating a big jump in LCR uh, for FY25. There's also another method of calculating LCR called the Generally Comparable District, or GCD. Um, that one requires the State Department to work with the U.S. Department of Education to look at individual contexts for school districts and come up with an LCR. Okay, so we're calculating our full funding payments. So now we have taken our student count. We've converted that into our average daily attendance. We've converted that into our student weights. And then we're going to multiply that by our local contribution rate, and that will give us our full funding impact aid payment. That will give us the amount that your school district would receive if it got, if impact aid were fully funded. So for our example that we were looking at before with weighted student units, there were 243.6 of those. We multiply that by $7,444.50, which was the half the national average LCR in FY24. And then we get a little over $1.8 million. So if this, if everything, if MPAC did were fully funded, um, the school district will get $1.8 million for their basic support payment. But impact aid is not fully funded. Congress does not give uh, the basic support program or any really part of impact aid, all of the money it needs. Um, so because we don't have enough money to pay all school districts their maximum payment, we need a form of proration. And that's where what's known as the lot comes in. The lot is the learning opportunity threshold. It's a needs-based proration measure. Um, each school district has its own lot percentage, and that is calculated by taking the percent of enrollment of federally connected students and adding the percent of the local school district budget made up of the impact aid maximum payment. Now, a school district can never have a lot higher than 100%. If you're a 100% lot district, you're considered the highest needs district. So how does this work? Here's an example. Let's say there's a school district whose maximum or full funding payment is $100,000. Uh, let's say their total current expenditures from three years prior um, is $2 million. Okay, so we are going to take what percentage that impact aid maximum payment is of their total current expenditures, and that's 5%. Let's say the school district has 25% of its students um, federally connected. So that means the district's lot is 25% plus 5%. So 30% lot district. This district's lot is 30%. That means that if Congress appropriates enough to pay 100% lot, which is a big measure that we use uh, at NAFIS because the program's so fully funded, it's just kind of out of the realm of possibility at this point in time, Congress will actually appropriate what is needed to fully fund the program. So we're aiming to, to get into 100% of lot. For this school district, their payment at 100% of lot would be their maximum payment, that 100,000 times their lot percentage of 30%. So their maximum payment would be $30,000. Okay, that is how lot works. Now, what happens when lot pays out or if appropriations are not high enough to even fund that 100% of lot? So then everyone gets an equal percentage of their lot that is less than 100%. So it's whatever the appropriation will pay out. So let's say it pays out at 94% lot. That district whose maximum payment was 100%, whose 100% lot payment was 30%, $30,000, excuse me, they would get 94% of $30,000 um, as their impact aid payment. Now, what if the appropriation can fund over 100% lot? That means all the 100% lot districts would get their full payment 
and other districts will receive an additional payment that's evenly prorated throughout the program um, with no district receiving more than its full funding or its maximum payment. And for the past few years, uh, the department has been able to pay out over 100% of lot, which is great. Um, you know, as we look to the future, you know, NAFIS is concerned that perhaps they won't be able to do so for FY25. So, and again, here's another example of how LOT actually works. So this, Jason earlier showed our 7002 payments overview. This is a page from our 7003. Again, it's from FY24, which has not yet been released and is not available on our website, though we're hoping to do so next week. Um, this is the data that our, we have for every school district in the program for 7003. So you've got your school district, your CD, which is your congressional district, the LOT percentage, the actual payment for 24, the full funding payment for 24, and then their student, their total enrollment and their federally connected student enrollments, um, as well as the amount that they received for their uh, children with disabilities payment. So if you look here, you look here at Lapway. Lapway is a 100% lot district. So that means because the department paid out over 100% of lot in FY24, that means that their full funding payment and their FY24 payment match. Um, so they got, you know, their entire impact aid payment that year. If you look up here at Blackfoot, they're a 34% lot district. So if you look at their full funding payment and then their actual FY24 payment, right, it's significantly less. So it's more than 34%, you know, their FY24 payment was higher than 34% of their full funding payment because of that proration, but it isn't necessarily going to be. Okay, they're gonna get um, significantly less of that full funding payment at this point. Um, and if you look, you know, in our payments overview, if you look down in the totals, you'll see by state how much each state would get um, if Impact Aid were fully funded. Okay, so that's the, the bulk of it, the, the basic support payment. Um, a couple other, programs to mention, one of which is children with disabilities. So this, again, funded at about $48 million for the past several years. This is an additional payment for Indian lands and military students who have an active IEP on the student count date. Um, civilian students, low rent housing students, you know, they, they are not included. It is only those Indian lands and those military connected students. And while most impact aid funds can be used for any general fund purpose, um, legal in the state, these funds must be spent on IDEA eligible activities. Now this um, calculation is much more simple than the basic support. You just take the appropriation divided by the number of eligible weighted student units across the country, you get a per unit payout, and that's you multiply that by the weighted units in your district. Um, for this, an Indian lands and a military on-base kid are each weighted a 1.0, whereas a military off base is a 0.5. Um, for FY24, they paid out at about $1,300 per weighted student unit um, or about $650 for military off base students with those active IEPs. Um, another piece of this for school districts that serve students who reside on Indian lands, they have an additional requirement with their impact aid application known as Indian policies and procedures. Um, these school districts are required to submit these documents, which are intended to ensure they have had a meaningful dialogue with the tribes they serve, so that participation by Indian children in the school program is equal to that of non-Indian children. You know, at this point, pretty much every school district has had their IPPs approved at least once, um, and they are really the important thing to do now is implement your IPPs as they are written. If there are things that you have in your IPPs that you are not doing, you should probably take them out of your IPPs for the next application cycle because when your school district is audited, they look for specific um, evidence that you have done everything you say you will. So as you're preparing your IPPs, please keep that in mind. Um, now, if, if your tribe, your local tribes uh, agree to it, they can waive 
the need for IPPs. So in that instance, you wouldn't have to, to do that. Um, there would be a letter that the tribe would send that you would upload into the impact date application in lieu of the IPPs. Um, the next program we're going to touch briefly on is Section 7007 Construction. So in FY24, that was funded at $19 million, which was a slight increase over 23 and 22, which is great. Um, but if you, you know, have ever had any construction projects needed in your district, you know that this is not a lot of money to be spread throughout all of the federally connected school districts across the nation. Um, so it's done in two ways. There's 707A, which are formula grants, and 707B, which are your discretionary grants. So your formula grants are given out in even fiscal years, and your competitive grants are given out in odd years. So for FY24, um, all school districts that were eligible should have just received their uh, formula construction payment. There was no additional application necessary. For FY25, there's going to be competitive grants, so the department will be soliciting applications. To be eligible for the formula grant program, your school district has to serve either 50% or more Indian land students or 50% or more military students or receive impact aid section 7003B2 funds, which are our, we call the heavily impacted funds. Um, so that kind of takes us through the whole section of the program. I know it's a lot of information. Um, and I apologize for just talking at you for so long. Just a couple more things to wrap up here. So again, as you're planning for this upcoming application cycle, remember that you need to submit that application by January 31st through the Impact Aid grant system, which you can access um, via impactaid.ed.gov. You have to do it by the 31st, even if there's, for example, a weather delay or a technical glitch, it doesn't matter if it's late. If it's between one and 60 days late, you're going to get a 10% reduction in your impact aid payment. Um, if it's more than 61 days late, you're not going to get any impact aid funds for the year. So you really want to get it in on time and ideally well in advance. Um, you know, once your, your application has been submitted and reviewed and everything, the department has started releasing payments, that's done electronically now. The payments are going to be electronically deposited. You'll be notified the payments were made electronically, and you'll be able to access an impact aid payment voucher uh, in the impact aid grant system. <clears throat> so now I'm going to turn it back to Jason to talk more about our advocacy priorities. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so, uh, so Davis and our members have worked really hard to ensure that the Impact Aid program enjoys strong bipartisan support here in D.C. Uh, that's reflected by steady but gradual increases uh, in funding over the years. As you can see, uh, here is a list of appropriations for both the basic support and federal property over fiscal years from 2018 through 2024. Uh, even in FY24, when few programs received uh, additional funding due to the um, implementation of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Impact Aid still received a modest increase of uh, $0.687 million. So looking ahead to uh, fiscal year 2025, both the House and Senate Appropriation Committees provided increases for the Impact Aid Program in their bills that were passed by committee. Uh, so while we were very grateful for the $5 million increase included in the House Labor Health Education Appropriations Bill, uh, we're working hard to support the $20 million increase provided in the Senate's version of the bill. Uh, specifically, that increase includes a $2 million increase for federal property, a $16.5 million increase for basic support, and a $1.5 million increase for the construction program. Uh, we'll also be, uh, through, you know, for the remainder of this year and this Congress, uh, we'll be continuing to build support for our two key pieces of legislation, which are the uh, Impact Aid Infrastructure Partnership Act and the Advancing Toward Impact Aid Full Funding Act. Both of those bills um, have enjoyed bipartisan support uh, and would really uh, provide much needed funding for the Impact Aid program if they were signed into law. Uh, so you may be asking yourself how you can kind of get engaged with uh, with us here at NAFIS and advocating for the Impact Aid program. Uh, you can join the NAFIS family, becoming a member of the association. Uh, you can attend uh, our two annual conferences here in D.C., as Nicole mentioned earlier. 
Uh, you can use the NAFIS Action Center, which you can find at navistdc.org. Uh, there we have links to uh, to letters that you can use to reach out to your congressman on different issues uh, and your senators as well. Uh, and you can speak when you're speaking to members of Congress, if you have that opportunity, let them know how impact aid is important for your community. Let them know how you use that money in your schools. Uh, make it personal. Uh, and then finally, you should uh, really uh, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter so you can keep up with what we'll, all the work that we're doing here at NAFIS. Uh, we, as, uh, as Nicole mentioned before, we uh, host two conferences here in D.C. Our 2024 uh, fall conference is coming up on September 22nd through the 24th. Uh, our, our theme this year is Navigating the Changing Landscape. Uh, so registration is now open. So please uh, head over to our website and you can find more information about our conference. And also please save the date for our 2025 uh, spring conference in March uh, from the 9th to the 11th. Uh, and I also want to mention that the uh, Federally Impacted uh, Schools Educational Foundation is also uh, hosting a number of technical assistance workshops in the coming months. Uh, they're listed here. Uh, on this Thursday, we'll be in Fort Liberty, uh, Fort Liberty, North Carolina. Uh, that registration has closed for that one, but you can keep an eye out for emails regarding our uh, workshops in Washington, D.C., Coronado, California, Phoenix, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, you can also uh, thank Anne for the great new logo that FISF has. Uh, with, with that, I know uh, Nicole and Angie have been tackling some of the questions in the chat, but uh, this is a great time to kind of get any last minute questions in there that you might have for us. Um, you can see here, uh, Nicole, Anne, and my contact information. Our emails are right there. Never hesitate to shoot us an email with anything that we uh, can't quite get to answer. Yes, and thank you so much, Jason and Anne. Uh, we're happy to answer any additional questions. Um, just let us know. This has been asked a few times, and we'll be we'll be sharing a recording of the webinar to all the attendees in case you uh, you had any trouble viewing the slides or engaging in the chat. Great. Uh, we will be sharing the PowerPoint. So look out for an email um, on that uh, in the recording of the webinar. Um, and please do not hesitate to reach out to us via email. Um, I know this can be overwhelming, particularly for you newbies on the webinar. We are here for you. If you have follow up questions, um, I would say that it takes a couple times um, receiving this information to really let it sink in. But I know you all have very unique circumstances on the ground where you're working. So please reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Um, our workshops are very, very helpful um, for those particular questions and to, again, get kind of a reminder, understand the application process a little bit more, um, all those great things. So, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, happy to answer any questions. If no more questions, again, thank you. Uh, please, um, you know, consider registering for the fall conference in Washington, D.C., and we look forward to uh, you joining us again very soon. Take care.